All right, welcome back in. Hanging with Hester, presented by Richard's Honda. Now I need Mario in here to not only teach us how to say Chicharito, but to <laughs> also break down the halftime show. Because if you've ever seen Mario's highlights of an LSU game, they are so fantastic. No, I love the... Uh... <clears throat> oh, he's in? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, th I, thought, I thought we had Cheaterito. No, no, no. We only in had, here. My bad. We actually have Chris Blair, the voice of the LSU Tigers. We were trying to get him. Now we have him. CB, what's up, brother? Not much, guys. Not much. Getting ready to pack up and travel for for the rest of the week and uh, go to Music City and then over to the plane. Well, if it makes you feel better, Ronnie is having a total Super Bowl hangover Monday here. How about the voice of the LSU Tigers? You watched Super Bowl last night? Yeah, I watched it uh, mainly. I, I got to be honest with you, mainly because my son wanted to watch it. Uh, I could, I could take it or leave it, but you know, it is the the big game, and everybody's supposed to watch it. So, we took it in. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the big halftime hubaloo, whatever that was about. That was when I decided to go into the kitchen and and have a snack. So, uh, but did watch the game, and I was happy for Kansas City. I was happy for the former Tigers, and uh, you know, it was a long time coming. And um, you know, I, I kind of heard you guys earlier in the hour talking about how the game played out. and You know, it just seemed like they didn't take enough shots, uh, Kansas City, I thought, early. Now, they did a couple of times, and, you know, obviously there were some interceptions, and maybe Patrick Mahomes wasn't completely on his game early. But, you know, I saw a lot of man-to-man -man coverage, a lot of one-on-ones. and You know, eventually uh, they kept going to the well. They, they, they finally pulled it together. So congratulations to them. Hey, real quick, before we moved to LSU basketball, we were kind of joking before you came on, that old defense wins championships might go out the window with this LSU team and this Kansas City team. Yeah, no, I heard you say that, and I've been uh, biting my tongue to say that for about <laughs> mm, six months. But now that you said it, yeah, I'm all on board with that. I just think the games have changed so much. I mean, obviously you got to have a great defense. and If you can have a great defense, that's certainly going to help you. So uh, I don't want to go completely overboard here, but – you know, I think the way offense has evolved and uh, the way that they're using every possible way uh, to get the football in the hands of guys who can make plays, whether that's tight ends that we saw last night for both teams, whether it's, you know, throwing out of the backfield to the running backs, which we also saw last night, and, and including receivers. Um, you know, I, I, I just think it makes it harder and will continue to make it harder for defenses. I mean, the old saying when you play football is if you're playing defense, the offensive guy has the advantage because he knows where he's going. Uh, and I think based on where the game has evolved now, that makes it even more difficult because not only does the offensive guy know where he's going, there's a bunch of offensive guys out there that know where they're going, and you've got to try to cover all of them. And that's kind of hard to do, um, you know, for a defense. Yeah, things you love to hear as a former offensive player. Well said there, CB. All right, let's move on to basketball. LSU takes care of Ole Miss 73-63. to And honestly, watching the entire game, it wasn't – that close and they continue to do a good job the last couple of games out when they get a lead they kind of hold the other team at bay they hadn't really had these big comebacks Ole Miss try it at the beginning of the second half LSU puts a stop to it pretty quickly there I thought it was another good performance by the Tigers who by the way move up to 18 in both polls yeah they moved up and uh, you know that's good you know in, the, in both polls they also move up in the net ranking uh, which is, uh, as we all know, Will Wade watches uh, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, uh, which he should, and he understands it very well. Um, but, you know, when you win 10 games straight and you're the only team unbeaten in the SEC, it's, it's no surprise that, that LSU is trending upward. And I agree with you. I, you know, I was telling somebody earlier this morning that, yeah, it was a 10-point game, but you know, that, that was not indicative of how uh, the game really played out. I give a lot of credit to Ole Miss, those guys, including Devontae Shuler, uh, just wouldn't stop, and good for them. They wanted to make it a respectable score. Um, they've had a difficult season with only one conference win, and, uh, you know, at times it looked like they easily could have said, you know what, this we've seen this movie before, and we're just going to pack it in and head on out, you know, when you get down by 21 points in the second half. Um, and, again, I give them a lot of credit because, as you pointed out, really it was a virtual 15-0 run into the first half and the opening moments of the second half to make a 20-point lead, an 8-point lead, and then LSU again, I think Will Wade got their attention and the intensity picked up, their focus locked in a little bit. Uh, there were some early shots in that second half where, you know, I know the coaching staff wasn't pleased with. Uh, in the first half, there was a lot of ball movement. They were working their ball screens. They were finding the open guy, and they were really making Ole Miss's defense cover every inch of the half court. They opened up the second half with that lead, and it was almost as if 
maybe they were buying too much into the hype and were just coming down and putting up shots, and, and that kind of led to Ole Miss climbing back in it for a little bit. Uh, but credit LSU. I mean, once they got woke up in the second half, they were able to build back that lead. But, you know, John Brady said something that, that really stood out to me Saturday, and that is we've talked all year about how many times LSU has made more free throws than their opponent has even attempted. We've also talked about how they've dominated on the glass in a big way overall and also on the offensive board. And then when you combine that with a team that shoots 48 to 49% in a given game and you also win the free throw battle, you also win the rebounding battle, that is a recipe that's very hard to overcome if you're anybody in the SEC. Now, there's been days and nights where they haven't shot the ball as well, but when they do, this is a tough team to handle. You know, we're talking to Chris Blair. You know, Chris, uh, the Monday after the Texas game, when um, when Coach Wade had his press conference, he was pretty hot, and he and he said, you know, how he was tired of, of you know the leads being blown, and he was going to get these guys' attention uh, that afternoon at practice, and and all that, and it was well documented on all the little news channels how he was going to be a wild man. He said, a crazy person, and. They've probably gone out and since played their best two games of the year, the most dominant games of the year, Alabama and Ole Miss. And uh, they've, it, you know, they went from just kind of surviving and advancing to now looking like a team that is, in my opinion, the best team in the league right now. Well, I, I can tell you this. I go to shoot-arounds before games to watch the team. I don't go to practices uh, because, to be honest with you, I'm afraid the way the practices are run that they, I may be out there running with the rest of the guys. So, <laughs> I just avoid going into the practice gym. But what I can tell you about the game leading up to Alabama and then obviously the game uh, against Ole Miss, that the shoot-arounds, and I even told Coach Wade this, and I mentioned it to Coach Brady, those two shoot-arounds were as precision. I mean, it was like watching a, a, a Marine Corps drill. They came in, they had whatever they, they work, an hour, 10 minutes, hour, 15 minutes, and there was no do-overs. Uh, in both in both rounds of shoot around, they, they they came in. They wanted to work on this. Boom, boom, boom. They worked on this. They worked on this. They, I mean, they, it was precision like, which is really the first time in all the time I've been around this team that that shoot arounds have gone like that. Typically, there's something they want to correct and they'll stop and they'll redo it and and they'll do it again and do it again until they get it right. That's the way Coach Will Wade operates. But I took note of the fact that the team literally went through it like uh, like like total professionals, as if. This is the time where a lot of guys, there's no time for us to, to have to slow down and redo things. we got to go in and take care of it first time out. And they did it in both of those um, practice sessions. And, and, again, coaches tell you all the time, what you do in practice more times than not is going to translate into what you do in the game. And I, and I thought they played two of their better games, certainly two of their better halves against Alabama and both Ole Miss because as much as they dominated Alabama on Wednesday night, you know, after that first half, we all looked around and thought, this may even be better than what they did on Wednesday against Alabama. Um, so I, I think that whatever he did in those first couple of days after that Texas win certainly got their attention. Um, and hopefully that's going to continue. But uh, I get the sense from Will, just talking to him, that uh, that's, that's kind of the way the rest of the season is going to go. There's there's not going to be any more excuses made or, or any failures that are going to be overlooked. They're, they're they're going to have to pay for any mistakes they make in practice. Chris, on Saturday, they uh, honored uh, Pistol Pete Maravich and, and his, his and alumni and his teammates were there, 50th anniversary of, of be, uh, passing Oscar Robertson's uh, all-time scoring record. And, you know, t if you're watching at home, you watch it on TV, they didn't really obviously cover all the festivities that were going on in the stadium. But for a guy like you that loves basketball, didn't grow up in this state, but obviously very familiar with Pistol Pete, what was that like and and, and – and uh, for all his teammates to be there was really special, it seemed. Yeah, it was it was incredible. I, I had talked to my dad uh, the night before, and uh, you know I remember growing up as a kid playing basketball, and you know uh, my dad initially saying, "If you want to be a point guard, son, then you need to pay attention uh, to Pistol Pete Maravich." And so I learned about Pistol Pete through my father, who was a student at UK uh, when Pete was playing for LSU, and you know he was as important to to my glossary or dictionary of basketball than, than anybody else who was playing currently when I was growing up. So I was talking to dad on Friday and I said, you know, we're, we're honoring uh, the 50th anniversary of the scoring record set by Pistol Pete. And I said, who would I ever imagine growing up all those years ago, I used to have the, the crew stocks and I literally used to pull them down. <laughs> uh, you know, didn't have anything like footies back then. Uh, or at least I didn't wear them. 
And everything that I tried to do, behind the back passes, the no-look passes, uh, the floater down the lane, all of that stuff, you know, it just kind of hit me that it's, it's very special. To your point, not growing up in this state, not growing up uh, around LSU, that that was the impact that Pistol Pete had on me so many, you know, hundreds of miles away. But I, I think there's a whole generation of kids and even generations today because of the Internet and YouTube videos and all the like that also have a, a, a very big understanding of, of what Pistol Pete did at LSU and eventually in the NBA. And there's things that he did then that you see every day now. And, and you know, here I think is probably the biggest um, ounce of respect I can give is uh, the fact that you still see things today that Pistol Pete was doing at LSU that even when it happens today, you're like, whoa! Uh, you know, a lot of things we take for granted, but there's still some plays that are made that look just like what Pete did that still make you uh, open your eyes uh, and uh, and appreciate it. So it was special for me. I really enjoyed it. I hated it. I had to talk during halftime. <laughs> John Brady didn't want to go out there, and finally Kent Lowe said, get out of here. So John had to leave, and I, I really wanted to take it all in because uh, it was a special moment. Catching up with Chris Blair, the voice of the LSU Tigers here on Hanging with Hester. Hey, looking at the schedule for this LSU basketball team, they travel on the road to Vanderbilt, and look, they hadn't lost on the road in two years in the conference. The last place you want to lose is the 14th place uh, SEC Vanderbilt <laughs> Commodores. I understand that, but you have a game against number 11 Auburn on the road coming up, and you always want to make sure as a coach you don't overlook the one in front of you. That's going to be the challenge heading into the schedule for LSU. You know, it's good. I think that LSU has played some teams already on their schedule in the SEC that were kind of in desperation mode. Uh, I think Vanderbilt is in that. I mean, at some point here in a couple of weeks, it'll probably, it'll be hard to, uh, for that coaching staff to grab their attention. Let's face it. It's, it's just been a tough year. It's been a tough two years, really. Um, but I think they're still in desperation mode. And I think because you go and play them on the road, uh, the way they played against Kentucky in the middle of last week tells you that on a given night, uh, they certainly can can put something up to challenge you. Um, so I don't think for that reason, Will Wade's going to overlook Vanderbilt. I, I don't think he's going to overlook anybody. Uh, but that's the thing you got to be concerned about. Are you going to see the Vanderbilt team that has lost all of these SEC games? Or at this point of the year, they're going to say, hey, let's try something different. Let's try to slow the game down. Let's make LSU work on the defensive end. And then just try to sell out defensively, maybe go zone, maybe pack the lane and just try to get charges when they drive in with the ball, something that would be unlike what Vanderbilt has done. And because of that unknown, I think that's why you you have to be ready to go and you got to be focused when you go there without worrying about what's coming up on Saturday in the matchup against Auburn. Um, You know, and that was really the theme, I think, going into the Ole Miss game because it was easy for Will Wade to remind this team, hey, we were 7-0 last year, guys, and we had beaten Arkansas at home, and then we let the Razorbacks come in here and snap that win streak in the SEC because we weren't locked in, and we didn't maybe respect the opponent the way we should have. So I'm sure that's going to be a storyline today, tomorrow, and leading into the game Wednesday night. All right, he is Chris Blair. joins us every single Monday here on Hang with Hester. CB, always appreciate the time. All right, guys, have a great week. Ronnie, hope you feel better. Thank you, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, feel better, or is it just like I spent too much time watching the Super Bowl? No, no, we're taking some meds. We're on, some, we're on some antis. Some my high for the hangover, or no, no, no. I'll take some my high. I'd love it. I'll take anything free. But uh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm genuinely sick. Okay. 